Gospel Revolutionaries, this is Daniel Rouse. Welcome to the Tuesday Night Study. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I want to talk tonight about the wheat and the tares. So this is a discussion we had on the podcast a few weeks ago, and I just felt like I wanted to dedicate a video just for that discussion. So uh, I want to jump right into it. We try to make these videos nice and short. So here is the wheat and the tares. You might remember this parable. It's a parable um, that's one time recorded in the book of Matthew and uh, chapter 13. Now, uh, you can go ahead and read the parable, but I want to jump right into the explanation that Jesus gives of the wheat and the tares. Now, before I get into that, I want to talk about a little bit of how this is perceived, uh, the wheat and the tares. Now, uh, to be honest with you, this is one of the um, parables, the teachings of Christ, if you will, that we get a lot of questions about. What about the wheat and the tares? Because here at the Gospel Revolution, we conclude that Christ took upon himself the judgment of the whole world in his death, burial, and resurrection some 2,000 years ago. And this judgment that he took upon himself, he took for the entire world, not just for believers. And it's not just imposed upon just the believers, but rather it was imposed and taken for the entire world, the entire cosmos, every man, woman, boy, and girl before the cross and after the cross. And at the cross, um, the Adamic race, the race of man that was sinful, died. And a new race, a new species of being that has never before existed, it's this God-man, this God-in-man, this man-in-God creation, was now brought forth. And now God-man are one. This is the gospel revolution at its core, that we are all one. So if that is true, then how do we deal with the wheat and the tares? Because... What has been the idea, and it's been presented by Christianity, I used to preach it as a Christian pastor, is that the wheat and the tares were about a coming judgment at the end of the world. That at the when Christ returned, and there's going to be a tribulation and all of this, and then at the judgment seat of Christ, uh, we were going to have this division between the wheat and the tares, and the wheat would be saved, those would be the saints and the believers, and they would go into heaven, and the tares would be thrown into fire, which has been transcribed as hell. Now, I want to redeem this parable because there is a very powerful message that we are missing, and there are some very imposed ideas that come in based on the translation that is being used from the Greek words in the explanation of this parable. Uh, in Matthew specifically, Matthew chapter 13 is where we first discovered this. And I want to propose it to you today. And of course, as we always do, we want you to study it out. We want you to look through it and ask questions. And many of you have asked us questions about this. And it has sharpened us in our understanding of it. Because when Michael and I first discovered this on the podcast, uh, we discovered it live. And if you listen to that podcast, this was all hot up the press. This wasn't something that we had pre-planned or prepared to share. It was something new. So uh, let's get into that here in Matthew chapter 13. And I want to start reading in verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitudes away and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. So there's a sower that's sowing good seed. Who is that? The Son of Man. That was Jesus. This was Jesus who was sowing the good seed. So Jesus sowed the good seed. The field is the world. The good seed are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Now, Jesus, and he didn't do this at every parable, but this parable, in and of itself, Jesus went into very detail 
about what each one of these things represented. The good seed are the seed that was sown by the Son of Man. Remember that. The seed that was sown by the Son of Man. Then we have the seed that was sown by the devil, the evil one. And then we have the field, which is the word of God. So we have these seeds that were put into the world. We have a seed that was planted by Jesus, and we have seeds that are planted by the devil. So, and then there's a harvest that's coming, and the harvest is supposed to happen at the end of the age. Now, I want to talk about that for a moment, because many Bible translations translate this as the end of the world. Now, when you start talking about the end of the world, this imagery that comes into our mind takes us so far off from what has been intended by the words that were actually spoken. The New King James, as I read here, they actually got it right. It was the end of the age. Now, Jesus, and I can't get into this for lack of time today, but I'm actually going to have a whole session on this in the upcoming conference, so stay tuned. and We're going to go really into detail about these ages. But in this uh, teaching and the teachings about an age, we understand that Jesus always talked about this end of the age that was coming. It was at hand. It was right here. Not something that's going to happen 2,000 years down the road, 3,000 years down the road, or any future uh, event that's far, far away. It was at the teaching of Christ. It was right there. They could grasp it. They could see it. The, the, the stars in the sky even pointed to the changing of the season. Remember when Jesus was born and they saw his star from the east? That star that they saw were people who studied the ages and they knew that an age was ending and they saw a star in the sky and a prophecy in the sky that prophesied of Jesus that was tied to the prophecies in the Hebrew scriptures. Oof, I know there's a lot in there. Again, not going to break that down, but just to point out the time that at this time, when this was being spoken, the end of the age was right at their grasp. They, they were entering into it. When did this age end? It ended at the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That ushered into a new age. And now when we look at this and it says at the end of the age, the end of the age that he's talking about is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. As I said, we've got teachings on it in other places about the end of the age. We've got some more coming to you fresh in this upcoming conference, uh, March 8th, 9th, and 10th. Make sure you check out Facebook and all that for details on that. The end of the age, we got good seed, we got bad seed. The good seed is from Jesus, the bad seed's from the devil. The field is the cosmos, the world. Okay. Um, verse 40, therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so will it be again at the end of the age. So not theme for us, that's futuristic. It was futuristic when Jesus was spoken to it, spoke, speaking it to them, but it was futuristic in the fact that it was shortly coming to pass. In this case, about two years. <laughs> in about two years, the end of the age is coming. They knew it. All the signs were pointed to it. The wise men knew it. That's why they came from afar to find Jesus, to look after the star, because it was the end of the age. So it was something that was very much in front of their face, looking at them, staring them down. Are you getting my point? Is it's not something that we today are looking futuristically to, an end of the age, the end of the world. It has already come. Now the age that we live in is the age that the Bible talks about, an age without end. One might call it eternity. That's what we live in today. Mm, good preaching. So at the end of the age <clears throat> is when these tares were going to be thrown into the fire. All right, so let's keep going with this. Therefore, as the tares are gathered together and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man, Jesus, will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Mm. At the end of the age, there's going to be a separation. 
That's what Jesus is saying. I want to say it the way that we need to read this today. At the end of the age, there was a separation. Now, in the prophecies, and I love the way that Michael has taught this over the years. It's, it's a, in the prophecy, we have two rails on a train track. And you got one side, judgment's coming, judgment's coming, judgment's coming, judgment's coming, judgment's coming, judgment's coming. And then on the other side, we got peace, peace, everlasting peace, everlasting peace, gospel of peace, everlasting peace, judgment's coming, judgment's coming. These prophecies ran parallel with each other. We had all of these horrid prophecies about uh, and there be no man left standing. Everyone will be done with. Everyone will gone away with. See, that is a, a, a death. That is a judgment. That is a prophecy that was fulfilled on the cross. The seed that was sown, the good seed, is the seed that Jesus planted. Now, let's think about this. Let's think about seed as far as it's concerned in the Bible story. All the way from Genesis, we have a promise that was given to the serpent. Uh, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel, his seed. From that moment on, we have all throughout the Bible history an attempt to contaminate that seed. That attempt to contaminate that seed was done in many different ways. Do you ever wonder why when Jesus uh, or when God gave commandments to the Jewish people, he told them not to intermarry. Why was that? It was to protect the seed. It's not something that we follow today. That's not a commandment that we follow. Don't intermarry with other races of people. That was specific to the story. It was specific to the story to make sure that that seed wasn't tainted, to make sure the seed wasn't touched. See, there was a seed that was going to bring forth a promise. Now, at the point of speaking this, listen very carefully. Jesus just shown up on the seed. At the point of speaking this, there is no good seed except for the Son of Man himself. At the point of telling the parable, in Matthew chapter 13, there is no good seed on the earth except for the seed himself, which is Christ. There is a whole lot of contaminated seed, contaminated by sin, contaminated by offense, contaminated by iniquity. You have all of this going on, but at the point of this, there's only one person who represents all good seed, and then you have all of humanity that represents all the bad seed. Now, where the story, the parable gets absolutely amazing, but it's absolutely destroyed and screwed up by the Bible translators. The Son of Man will send out his angels and will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. Now, this is what we found on the podcast. All things that offend. All things that offend. Four words. In the Greek, there's only two. What are those two words? All offense. He will gather out of his kingdom, his kingdom, out of his kingdom. Remember, the kingdom wasn't yet made manifest until he was raised from the dead. So this is a post-resurrection thing that would happen. Out of his kingdom, he would take out all offense. Mm. And take away, he will gather out of his kingdom all offense. And then we have another one. And those who practice iniquity. Another four words. And on this one, 
Again, we only have two. What is it? It's, it's a word, yes, that yes, that can be translated as do iniquity, as those who do iniquity, or it can be translated as that which causes iniquity. Now, I will give you full disclosure. When you go to some, now Strong's Concordance doesn't have this, but when you go to some of the Bible interlinears, where you can look at the Greek words that are laid out, they have uh, put these words into the Hebrew, even into the Greek language, that show uh, a them or a there or uh, different things like that. But you don't see that in the Strong's Concordance. Some do and some don't. So let's just assume that they do, because if they do, then one can point out and say, it's talking about them that do iniquity, them. Some, some interlinears throw that them in there. However, that them has to be uh, correspond with the following words. So is it that he is saying them that do iniquity or that which causes iniquity. Now, when Michael and I followed up on this uh, from the podcast, Michael really went to town preaching because then he started to say, what exactly did Christ do on the cross? Is the first thing he did is he nailed the law to the cross. He nailed the law and its commandments, its ordinances. He nailed it to the cross. Oh, that is so good. That is the thing which causes, which works iniquity. The, the law. That which offends. What is that? That's the law. The law and its ordinances were nailed to the cross. So he gathered out of his kingdom anything that would offend and anything that would work iniquity amongst the people. If you take out the law, if you take out the ordinances, you have taken out the very thing that offends and causes iniquity. We wouldn't have known sin if it weren't for the law. Yes, there was this indwelling sin that had to be dealt with, and that was dealt with through the death of the Adamic race in Christ. If Christ died, then all died. <laughs> all are dead. All are dead if Christ died. All that uh, were alive in Adam were found dead in Christ, but when they died, they also were made alive with him. And when they were made alive, they weren't made alive apart from him. They were made alive with him, through him, in him, by him. So this is the whole process that we're seeing in this wonderful parable, is that we have this judgment, judgment, judgment. I'm going to take everybody that doesn't belong and I'm going to cast them in. That's what it was translated as. But what we see through the death, burial, and resurrection is that is not what happened. Yes, there was the death of humanity. There was the death of the Adamic race. That did happen. But out of that came the newness of life. Now, that does not apply to us because you and me, baby, we were born this way. We were born into righteousness. And because we were born into righteousness, now what did he do in his kingdom? In the kingdom where all are good seed now? Now he took out of it that which offends and that which works iniquity. And what did he do with it? He cast it into the fire. Now, hell is not in this parable, but they sure like to paint a fiery hell with this parable. What did we learn about fire? It's in the Bible, in the Bible, fire is a pure fire. Fire is a purger. God is a consuming fire. What happens when a sacrifice is made? It's offered up in fire. So we have this fire involvement, this purification in, in, in progress. And what are we seeing in this whole picture? It's all summed up in this last verse I want to read to you. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their God. He who has an ear, let him hear. So what's going to happen when he has taken all the tares and he brought it into himself. 
He died and he rose again, killing off the tares, but not destroying. He made him alive. He made him a new creation. And now in his kingdom that is now established post-cross, what did he do? He removed out of it anything that would cause offense and anything that would cause iniquity. This teaching is substantiated by the Apostle Paul in Corinthians when he talks about that God will take out that which defiles the temple. Another very grossly misinterpreted verse. But what he's saying is that he's not going to destroy the people. He's going to destroy the defilement, the law, and sin. That has been removed from humanity. The law and sin has been purged out of humanity at the death, burial, and resurrection of the cross. My friends, this parable, it's not about us. It's nothing about what we've experienced. It's about something that 2,000 years ago humanity experienced, but it's definitely not something you're going to experience. The only thing you're going to experience is this latter part, that your righteousness will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. This is good news. My friends, you don't have to fear the wheat and the tares. You don't have to fear the harvest at the end of the age. It's already been done. And because of it, the result of it is righteousness that endures forever and ever and ever in an age without end. I love you. Fear not. Enjoy righteousness. Enjoy who you are in Christ.